Hi, everyone. And uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. And I'm also very happy to be following such excellent speakers. I think this will be a very a good com uh, compliment to um, Dr. Tarazi's talk, because we share a lot of the same values, although this is applied to a university setting. And we also share a bit the spirit that uh, we sometimes have to work within existing confines. Uh, I love uh, people who are trying to completely disrupt the university uh, or coming up with brand new models like the Minerva project, which if you haven't looked at it, you really should. Uh, but the reality is that we are, the, the world is full of universities with um, millions of students in existing lecture halls with uh, existing structures and so on. And if we cannot uh, innovate within those structures, we're leaving out a large uh, part of the society for some tiny little shining stars of, of startups. Um, and I think there is still a lot of things that we can do within those structures. So uh, I'm uh, from uh, EPFL in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. And I'm from an interesting lab. It's located within computer science. But we look at computer-human interaction in learning and instruction. And we look across the whole spectrum. We do robotics in primary school. We do eye tracking and analytics. We do MOOCs. Um, and it's, it's a very exciting place to be. Uh, brand new this year, in affiliation with our lab, we also have uh, EdTech. Um, we call it a collider. It's not quite an incubator, because you have some brand new companies. You have some companies that have existed for a while. And the idea is to bring a lot of this energy together. We have now over 50 startups uh, that are affiliated with the center. Uh, so it's also very exciting to see what they are going to create and how perhaps we can find ways of working between the researchers and the startups. So I want to start by asking a question. What would it mean for universities to focus on learning? And that might seem strange, because you would say, well, that's what universities do, right? So teaching is even the second thing. The first thing is research, right? And we're not going to, there's lots of stuff to be said about digital research. That's a whole different talk. But even going beyond research, they teach. They don't focus on learning mostly, right? So if a university said, you know, our goal is not to give a good lecture, it is to create the environment that enables learning by our students, what would that change? Well, to me, the first thing they would have to do would be to go beyond the individual courses. Most of the innovation that you will see in universities is in a specific course, in a specific session, we're using this tool for this cool purpose. And I will mention some of that because it is cool. But if you really want students to come out of a university degree that they've paid a lot for or the government has paid a lot of money for, that they've taken three or four years of their life for, you need to look at the program. What is it that you want them to acquire after three or four years in a liberal arts degree, in an engineering degree, right? You want them to be critical thinkers. Same thing we want for primary school students, but at a different level, right? Critical thinkers, being able to do research, being able to be collaborative, creative, and so on. Okay, if that's what you want, then we now have to go back and say, well, what are the courses that we should be teaching them? Or what is the, the spectrum of courses that we should be offering to meet this, and what should be the content of these courses, and how do these all fit together? And how do we measure, right? So any university you ask, they will say we want to train um, critical citizens, engaged citizens, entrepreneurs, and you say, how do you measure that? How many percentage of your graduating class is a critical citizen? And they will have no answer for you. Okay, they, they might tell you how many people graduated, what kind of jobs they got. They are not measuring the things that they themselves say matter. It's not trivial to measure, but there is a lot of research about how do you measure these kind of things. Um, if you don't measure them, there's no way that you can improve. Right? So you need to start collecting relevant indicators throughout the courses. You don't wait until the fourth year and give them a creativity test and then say whether you pass or fail, right? You track them longitudinally across courses. Right now, at the top universities of the world, the, for each course, there is a single number entered into the, the, the university database, right? It's a percentage score. He spent six months learning this course, and he got a 73. 
And in the end, you have a list of 10 or 20 or 30 percentage scores, and you say he graduated, he didn't graduate. Okay? This is not enough information. And then finally, to be able to reach these indicators that we've now developed and that we've tested and that we're tracking, we need to develop course activities and structures that help students reach those learning objectives, right? So this is backward design. This is nothing new. This has nothing really to do with technology. But if you don't have this in place, the technology is not going to help you. So if you want them to be engaged citizens, then what are the activities that you're, that you're proposing to them, right? And don't just give them a bunch of stuff that's exactly the same thing that you learned when you were in school, and then just assume that by osmosis, they will kind of become critical. Some of them will, but some of them won't. Okay? Now, what I just told you is really important, but it's very much focused on the university, right? You need to define this. You need to measure this. You need to track this. And what, the students are just sheep? They're just going through the process? What is important to the students? Sorry. So, when the student comes in, are you helping them define their own learning goals? Those learning goals will change. You say, well, he's a 17, 18, 19 year old. They don't know what they need to know. Okay, but can we start them on the process of reflecting about what they need to know? And can we then have them write that down, track that, so, and update that every year, and look back critically? What did you do last year? Did that help you meet your learning objectives? Did it make you change your learning objectives? That is becoming a reflective, self-directed, self-motivated learner, right? And we talked about tracking. We talked about the university, keeping track of where students are, how they're developing across these axes. How about giving students ownership of their own learning analytics data and their own assessments shared with the university? The university wants to have access for their purposes, but this student is going to go on beyond the university. Can they take their data with them? This, students today are not just in the university. They're taking MOOCs. They're doing, uh, they're doing startups on the side, right? They're active in organizations. They're generating data. They're running, and they're on RunKeeper, seeing how much they've run this week, okay? Is there a way for them to integrate all of this data and, again, become these reflected, self-directed people, not just learners, but people who are developing themselves? And what I just said is, is university, for the university, what you do in the course is everything. For the student, it might be actually a fairly small amount of, uh, of the learning that happens. So, as I said, everything I mentioned right now applies whether you have technology or not. But we are interested in technology. There are many ways in which technology can help us. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, measure and track learning, right? Learning analytics right now is a very hot field. There's conferences, there's journals, there's a lot of companies. Um, it's a way for all the computer scientists to kind of get in on education without having to worry too much about pedagogy. Um, however, so far, most of the stuff that's being done is for a specific course, for a specific platform. You know, here's your Blackboard analytics. Here's a really cool dashboard about how many forum posts you wrote in Blackboard for that course. Okay, that tells you something maybe. But once that course is over, it's gone. It's usually only accessible to the teacher. It only covers Blackboard, right? It's very poor. And there's new approaches. So for example, uh, something called Experience API. This is the idea of having a common format in which different platforms can report very flexible data. So any system, including you know, a MOOC provider, including RunKeeper for your jogs, uh, including Blackboard, can issue statements. The statements are very flexible because they say subject, verb, object. Stian gave a talk about digital education. However, these are not as simple as I just mentioned. They're linked data URLs. What that means is instead of Stian, it's uh, at Hoshuang which is a unique identifier from Twitter. That could be one example. It would be a student ID. It's a linked identifier. Instead of gave a presentation, it would link to a definition of a 
a presentation, it might be a different for a class presentation as for a conference presentation, right? So you can do very sophisticated analysis, and the very cool thing about it is that not only can you subscribe to these notifications from multiple systems, you can send them to multiple places. So you have this concept of a learning record store. You can have multiple, they can be federated, they can talk to each other. So you can have uh, Coursera, obviously want to keep their own analytics. When you're taking an online course, they wanna know what you're doing. Student gets their own data, okay? Maybe the student says, I wanna share this data with my university because it would be useful for them to see what I did on this MOOC. And so, and when I finish, I can take it with me, okay? So this is something that's growing very rapidly. It's still in its infancy, but I think anyone who's, who's uh, developing technological products, anyone who's, who's building integrations should look at this um, and think about how to give students ownership and how to integrate multiple platforms. But, you know, when we talk about learning analytics, we often uh, talk about kind of capturing automatic data. Because the nice thing about online platforms is you get so much, we call it behavioral dust. Because it's the fact that I click the button, which in itself has no semantic meaning, right? It's not, however, if we have millions of those data points, you can maybe make some kind of prediction about me, right? And again, the computer scientists get very excited and they start throwing their IBM Watsons and, and all that kind of stuff, right? No, we don't need to know theory. We don't need pedagogy, okay? How about all the work that's already being done in universities? So when I was at the University of Toronto, we would have an introductory course where we would have five people being teaching assistants. We would sit there and we would correct essays. And we would take every page and we'd say, this is a spelling mistake, and here you forgot the, the, the thesis statement, and here you're not making connection between A and B, right? And we're spending hours and hours and hours on this. Students get the essay back, they look at it, they say, oh, I got B plus, okay, whatever, try harder next time, okay? All of that effort wasted. Now, what if we were doing that grading on a digital platform that actually captured semantically meaningful data? This is a spelling mistake. This is, you know, failure to link between theses. This is language not very sophisticated. This is improper use of citations. And what if that was available to a student and trackable over time? And you could see, well, you handed in three or four essays this term in four different courses. And you started out being really weak in thesis statements, but you know what? You're getting really good. Or, you know, you're still struggling with citations, but here's an online class you can take, or here's a workshop, or, you know, here's something that can help you. And you can not only, as a university, say, we can show that our students got better in academic writing, which is one of those crucial skills that we want them to gain, but the individual students can, can track their own progress and can get appropriate help. Well, what I just said. Have you, how many people here have heard about digital open badges? So, Badges, I don't know if you have Boy Scouts in, in Lebanon, but uh, in Boy Scouts or in the Army, you get badges for different things that you've done, right? And people thought, you know, this could be something interesting to apply to education. The specific model of digital open badges, though, is interesting. Because what they say is a digital badge is a claim. A claim that I know something, that I have a skill, that I'm capable of something. Okay? It's a digital claim. It's a portable claim. So I can take a digital badge from your platform, from AUB or from Coursera or from wherever, and I can take it with me and I can put it on LinkedIn, I can put it on Facebook, and I can put it on my own website, okay? And it's authenticated, it's digitally signed. So if I put an AUB badge on LinkedIn or on my personal webpage, you can verify that that came from AUB. I can't fake it. So already, that's pretty neat, but there's an added thing, because still, what I'm saying now, it sounds like I have to trust AUB, right? If you have, this is how degrees work. You have an AUB degree, I can verify that you have it. Did you learn anything? I have to trust AUB to be a good university with good assessment. And that blocks out a lot of newcomers in the market. If you don't have AUB's reputation, how can you compete? Well, a digital badge, it has a claim it links to the criteria for evaluating that claim. So if, if I say I can give a presentation publicly, 
Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, you're confident, you can prepare, you can state your time limit, you speak, you enunciate. Okay, very specific. And then, how do you prove it? So it has to link to the proof. The proof might be the recording of this session. It might be a, a number of sessions. It might be the recording of this session plus my self-critique plus, you know, that's all transparent. And so if I post that badge, you can say, I trust AUB, so it's probably good. Or you can say, I want to verify. And you can actually track it back. And it becomes something very powerful that some universities in the US now and other places are investigating for exactly the purpose of tracking those skills that we want the students to gain, but which are not the course titles, right? First year, intro to statistics, intro to political science, second year, advanced political science, and you got good grades in all of them. But did you learn public speaking? Did you learn critical thinking? Did you learn respectful disagreement over a very contested topic? I don't know. And you can actually say this is, you need to get these badges over the course of four years. These are the criteria. There are many ways in which you can demonstrate your achievement of those, uh, uh, those uh, criteria. And you have to apply for them. You have to show and link to that evidence to get your final degree. There are universities that are doing really interesting experiments with that now. And actually, the Minerva project that was mentioned, their whole first year assessment is based on this. So they don't give you course, as far as I understand, they don't give you course grades. They just say, here's the 100 skills broken down and categorized that we want a liberal arts first year student to know. And you have to demonstrate it. And you can go into your dashboard, and you, after six months, you say, I haven't really demonstrated critical thinking. You know, and critical thinking has a subcategory, and it's uh, you know, taking apart an argument. So in the next class, I'm going to make sure that I speak up in a way that the teacher will mark me down and saying I demonstrated that. Or I'll submit a piece of pay, uh, written work. I'll link to a blog post. It's a very different way of thinking about learning objectives and tracking them. It's something, again, that technology can help us with. But it's the teachers, the designers, the students that do the hard work. OK. So I talked about tracking. I talked about programs. But again, once we have all of that in place, we still need to make it happen. We still need to make people actually meet those learning goals. And what happened in the classroom or outside the classroom is crucially important. So how can uh, technology help teacher engagement, student engagement? Because I think everyone, there's not many accepted truths in education. But the fact that active learning, the fact that the more students actively engage in whatever way, with some content, the better they learn it. It's fairly well understood. Now, how many here have heard about Eric Mazur and peer instruction? Wow. So that's good news, because it means you have something to look forward to. Um, Eric Mazur is an MIT professor in physics. Um, a lot of the people making innovations in education are not necessarily education professors. Um, and he came up with very, very simple intervention, but, but very profound. So he's teaching, he's lecturing complex topics, just like I'm doing, well, this isn't so complex, but uh, he's up here. And of course, students are, yeah, it kind of makes sense to me. Then they go home, they find out they, it, they didn't quite catch it. So he would stop the class, and he would give them a, a difficult problem. He'll say, OK, let's say you have two trains. One leaves uh, you know, the station, and one leaves the other, and there's a horse, and what would happen? So, so they have to really, it shows that you know the concepts, right? You, you're, are you able to apply these concepts that you learned to a real situation? And it's, uh, so he uses a clicker, right? So it's, it's uh, audience response. You have something, either you have a physical device or you just have something on your cell phone where you can say A, B, C, D, okay? So everyone thinks for three minutes and then they say A, B, C, D. Okay, of course, half the class gets it wrong because they haven't learned it. They, they didn't quite understand it. Now, he could have, so the traditional way of using clickers would be say, okay, that's useful. For, a, now we had three minutes of, of critical thinking, so that's already a win. And B, I have some feedback, which means that I can now spend more time explaining. If 90% had got it, I would move quicker, but because 50% didn't get it, I'm gonna sh explain more. That's already a win compared to a normal, normal lecture, okay? But what he did was say, okay, now turn to the person next to you. Try to convince them of your position. Three minutes. Very simple. Now vote again. 90% got it right. Okay? So what does that mean? Does it mean that the people who are smart are more convincing? 
That's, <laughs> that's one interpretation. Or does it mean that once you start debating with other people, even it's a random person, right? It's a person who happens to sit next to you and, you, and he's questioning your judgment, and you start thinking through it, and you actually get somewhere. And even if you were in those 10% who didn't get it, or even if you voted because you're kind of convinced, but you still don't quite get it, when the teacher goes back and explains again, you're going to be so much more likely to understand because you've grappled with this problem already. So very low-tech intervention. You didn't even have to have the clicker technically, although as a commitment device, I think it, it really makes a difference. If he just asks you to think about it, it's different from you saying, I voted A, and I want to know if it's A or not. Um, but it's very low-tech. We have uh, this idea of flipped classrooms. So instead of you all being here listening to me for an hour, what we could have done was to say, before you came to the conference, watch a video on YouTube of me talking for half an hour, and then come here and we'll sit in groups of four and we'll discuss how to do education better. And that might have been a better use of our time if I could have ensured that you'd all watch the video, which is hard with adults. It's a little bit easier with, um, with the students, especially because you can give them a quiz at the beginning. Uh, so this is becoming very popular because it's basically optimizing the physical time. Right? We're saying physical time, face-to-face -face is important. Online is important. They have different uses. Watching a video is awesome online. Talking to people is awesome in person. So why don't we optimize? However, the problem that people get is, OK, now we have two hours in a big auditorium. What do we do? We don't have to listen to the guy in front. But what do we do? If it's a math class, OK, you work on assignments. And if you don't know the answer, you can ask the person next to you. You can ask the tutor. What if it's a politics class? What if it's a philosophy class? There's not really a problem to work on. So we need to come up with kind of interactive, active learning scenarios that work in large lectures. And that's often difficult. Especially, again, like if you have 20 people in a, in a primary, secondary school, if you're a good teacher, you can come up with so many different ways of organizing a debate, a discussion, a competition. With 250 people, uh, the biggest lecture hall in University of Toronto seats 1,600 people. Okay? Introductory physics has 1,600 people physically present. Beyond the third row, it's all distance education anyway. <laughs> so in uh, my field, which is computer-supported collaborative learning, there has been lots of thinking about what are really productive scripts, just like Eric Mazur I mentioned was one example. Here's one that my, um, my supervisor in, in uh, Lausanne came up with more than 10 years ago. He said, we want people to discuss in pairs, but we don't want them to, because they often sit next to their friend and they're just all going to agree about everything, so that's not very productive. We want to optimize how different opinions they have. So, you know, let's start with asking a simple quiz. The question is, in large city marathons, should drug testing be applied? So we're trying to talk about some um, current issue in politics. Ethics, philosophy, there's lots of issues that could be addressed here. Now the thing is, you could have a different opinion for two reasons. You could say you should not do, drug test, you should not do drugs in, in sports because it's unfair or because it's bad for the health of the athletes. Those are kind of two different dimensions of that question. So with this simple quiz, you tease apart those dimensions and you can map out the students in the class on this little graph, this very scientific graph. And when you've done that, you can then optimize the dis you can form pairs such that the distance is optimized. Meaning, these are the most different pairs that you could form in this class. Okay? And then, you, similar to what Mazur did, you say, okay, now answer the question again, but I need one answer. Right? Now, the difference is there's no right and wrong answer here. Right? In Missouri's class, it was a physics problem. There is a right and wrong answer. Here, there isn't. But you really want people to try to convince, to, be, to bring out all the different arguments, and to, to see a lot of arguments that they hadn't considered before. And then, in the end, the, the teacher can do a debriefing and stuff like that. So you know, they did that a bunch of times. It's empirically proven. They got really good results, much better than random groupings. But this was done in small classrooms. You saw, this was 20 students in a small classroom. They moved around in the classroom. And we're thinking, well, you got 350. Oh, well, I guess we just have to lecture, right? Or we should lobby the politicians to give us lots of money so every university course could be 20 students. That would be great. But uh, in the meantime, what we thought is, if we think of this 
So basically, we need some technology. The problem with technology is the distance between the teacher and the designer of the technology. Okay? They actually made a software platform that let you run this specific scenario. It's available somewhere. Okay? But then you come in and you're like, I have a slightly different scenario. Actually, in my course, what I want to do is this and this. Okay? Well, then you can't do it, so then either you suck it up and you use this approach, or you just go back to lecturing. What we said is, can we take this representation of the script where you have the individual doing something, the team doing something, the class doing something, you have some activities, they're linked in some way, and um, to manage the linkage, we just need some workflow operators in the meantime, because we need to take the individual questionnaire, and then we need to map, make that map, right? And then we need to um, just keep the information flowing. You don't have to read all this. Uh, the idea is just, what would we need to do to express this script? And can we create a platform where you could come in and create that script or any other script and run it? Right? And that's what we're building. So uh, you have the time axis, you have the different activities, and you have these uh, little functions that you know, group students based on a criteria or download data from the internet or distribute content from one group to another group. Very flexible. And then you can, for example, have three different students working on different, uh, different ideas, voting up and down. They can chat with each other. And then when they voted up the best ideas, you can, go to the, you can have some kind of a visual exercise where you're grouping them. And again, these activities, this is a visual grouping. The previous one was a voting up and down. They're totally generic. The thing that they're voting up and down could be, uh, could be news headlines or it could be the best ideas for solving uh, a business case, right? This, this visual grouping could be anything. So you're creating these building blocks that are very flexible. Um, and of course, if you're running this in a class as a teacher, you want to know what students are up to, right? This most scary thing for a teacher doing a flipped classroom, active learning, is instead of all of you looking at me and I kind of telling whether someone's sleeping or not, suddenly you're all looking at your laptops or each, on each other. And I don't know if you're paying attention, if you're on Facebook, if you're talking about the football game. So we need not only to know if you're engaged, but how you're doing. Are you lost? Do you need help? Are everyone done? Can I move to the next activity? And we need contextual. So, so you have the concept of dashboards, but usually you know, one size fits all. But if you're watching a video or you're writing a collaborative essay, you need very different information. So we have this concept of conceptual dashboards. Here's a dashboard showing students watching a video. Right? So imagine you say, well, you have to finish watching this video for five minutes. Then you're going to go into your groups and you're going to discuss. And so here, at a glance, you see you know, the top one, he paused. And actually, this thing slowly changes color. So the fact that it's red means he's been paused for a long time. So either you went to the bathroom or you might start to worry about him. And uh, Olsen is almost finishing the video, but uh, Peterson is quit pretty early on. So either he paused it or maybe he went back because he wanted to re-watch re something. right? So this is a, a video watching dashboard. There's another dashboard if they're uh, collaboratively writing. You want to know what they're writing about. You want to know how, how well they're collaborating. Uh, this will look different also at different scales. So this is for 20 students. If you had 200 students watching videos, you need different kinds of representations. And that's one of the things we're, we're looking at. And the idea is to have an ecosystem of these really rich activity types. That, because these are plugins. Anyone can build, well, you need to be a programmer, but it's, we're trying to make it as simple as possible to build new types. If you want to do a physics simulation, you want to do an anatomy exercise where you, you know, cut off layers of skin and stuff like that, you can make it collaborative. You can make it part of a learning flow. You can have dashboards. You can have orchestration where the teacher says, stop, pause, go into this group, go to the next activity very easily. And that way, uh, and of course, you can share these, these scenarios. So just like the, the learning objects that you have uh, that you just heard about, you know, you could have this concept of, of graphs that, uh, that professors share with each other and improve upon. 
Okay. So hopefully with this tool, we can get much more rich active learning in classrooms. This tool um, will be tested for the first time in two weeks with 350 students in a first year statistics class. It's been under development for one year. It's open source, it's available to everyone, but it's not really ready for production. But if you're interested in collaborating, I'd be interested. So um, we are very rapidly um, testing it in multiple contexts. We're going to test it in a MOOC. We're going to test it in a smaller graduate course. Um, so, so that is one strand. The second strand is what I call fostering knowledge communities. Because in many of those disciplines that are important to me, you know, there's not one right answer. And also in this more complex, more global, more diverse world, there is a really a need for multiple voices. Right? So the teacher standing here, he doesn't know the whole answer. He can, cannot know all the different perspectives. So you really want students to engage, to contribute, and to feel like they're part of a community that are building knowledge together. Okay, you're in a university, you have students who came in from Syria, you have students who are international, uh, you have students who have different family backgrounds. And when we're talking master programs or professional programs, you have people coming in with a wealth of information um, that first of all, it's important to validate, right? To say that your experience, your background, your language skills are really important and are really valuable to other students. But it also enriches the learning of everyone. How do you do that? So this is an example of a course for teachers, future teachers who should learn how to use technology. And we wanted them to be very active participants because we also wanted to show them how technology can be a transformative part of the classroom. So the way of showing that is not by giving lectures for three hours. You need to get them using the technology. Um, so we had them use wikis, we had them use collaborative editing tools, we had them co-construct lesson plans and um, work in, in groups. And this was in a university course that was fairly small. The big challenge, because again, a lot of people say, yeah, you can do that with 20 people. You can do that when you have a lot of resources. Then we said, can we scale this model up? Can we do something like this in a MOOC? So we ran a course on edX, and we invited, this was for in-service teachers. This was for teachers who were in schools working, who wanted to do professional development, how to use technology to introduce new kinds of pedagogy. Right? It's not about how to use PowerPoint. It's about how does these technologies change the way in which we can teach. And because it was so much larger, we had to think much more kind of systematically about how is this all going to fit together. Right? And so we had all kinds of different things going on. You don't have to understand the whole graph, but we had content coming from the university course introduced to the MOOC. And we had the output from the groups in the MOOC go into the future university course. So a course is not isolated. It is part of a history that communicates with previous sessions and which produces output that is useful not just to your other students, but that, that's really important, but also to future generations, right? So you're already saying, well, you are not just some blank sheet that we're all imprint on, but you are part of this, this movement of people trying to figure out how learning works. Um, we had, you know, so this was, we had 8,000 people who signed up, but about 2,000 who really actively engaged. And there's two things that we did, kind of two different levels. The first level is, what can we do with 2,000 students that we couldn't do with 20? And with 2,000 students, so these students all are teachers. They know resources, for example, right? So we say, what is one good technology resource in your field? You're a physics teacher. You know, oh, there's this one really nice physics uh, simulation or this really nice video or this really nice graphical calculator app that, you know. Okay, that takes you five minutes. And now we have 2,000 resources. And then we ask them, here's a few resources suggested by your peers. Can you vote on them? Can you tag them? Can you comment on how you would use this resource in your field? And because we know who you are, because when you signed up, you gave us some tags so we can give the physics teacher physics resources and stuff like that. Now we have 2,000 resources 
tagged, sorted, ranked, linked. And that becomes a really cool resource for those teachers and for future generations, as I just mentioned, right? Um, so that's kind of the crowdsourcing, the intelligence of the masses aspect. But we also think that this kind of close collaboration in very small groups is very powerful, right? So the second aspect is how can you keep what's really rich about very small classrooms when you go big scale? It could be a big auditorium or it could be, it could be a MOOC. And so we said, you know, you're going to go into small groups. You're going to, over six weeks, create a lesson plan that is related to your work because you're a professional. This should be something that's useful to you when you go back into the school. Maybe you can implement this lesson plan. This should be something that's related to a problem that you have in your teaching. And you should work with these other people and come up with this. And every week, if you, if you go back to, the, to this graph, you have these people, it was optional, okay? Because we knew this was a MOOC. We didn't want to force people to do something they didn't want. If you want to just watch the videos, crowdsource, contribute at that level, you can do it. If you want to go down here in the design strand, where you find some other people every week. So you start off by all, this, all these cool ideas coming from the crowdsourcing and from previous generations of this course. So you're not starting from zero, and you're not starting just with what the teacher told you. Then you're starting to do uh, the, the, the creative work here inspired every week. I'm done. Give me two more minutes. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Uh, two more minutes. So inspired every week by the topics, right? So in week three, collaborative learning. You're watching videos about collaborative learning. You're doing uh, personal reflection about collaborative learning. You're doing team discussion about collaborative learning. And then you go into your lesson design group and you say, how can this incorporate collaborative learning? Um, and okay, I'll, I'll end on this because it's really cool. Uh, this is a MOOC made by the Norwegian Red Cross and the Geneva Organization for emergency ambulance drivers all around the world. Okay, um, you see, it's also uh, offered in Arabic. And what they did was the result of this course was 400 pages of edited case studies that was then you know, delivered back to their respective organizations. This is another example of how you know, this knowledge community approach of harnessing the, 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 the information that's already out there and creating networks. So I, I'll end there, but I'll just say, uh, I'll just end there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions for Stian? Uh, so he asked the, the, the application that I showed you is uh, free, open source, who's funding it. Uh, it's a research project, so it's funded as a research project. Um, where, you know, we'll see where it goes, uh, if it actually becomes a commercial project. Well, it can be commercial while still being, it's open source for eternity. There could still be a company that, that has a service model around that. It could be a nonprofit. It could get, we don't know yet, for, but it's free. And we believe in that. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a question about the use of e-portfolios. Do you recommend that there will be a student e-portfolio where he can post what he has learned, what skills are, uh, and how to assess the e-portfolio if you, if you recommend it? I, I think e-portfolios can be very good. I mean, it, it links up against what I, what I was saying. Uh, ideally, it would be something that goes across courses. So you could have one within a single course, but it would be really cool if you had one that, uh, that had um, the length of a course. Uh, you're starting to see more and more professions actually looking at this, right? So uh, if you're a programmer, everyone will ask you, what's your GitHub profile, right? It's a place where people post source code. And you, you say, I don't care about your grades. Show me what you've written, okay? If you're an artist, if you're applying for a design school, and my wife is a filmmaker, she applied for the, the Master of Fine Arts, Show me your film, show me your clips, show me what you've done. Now, I think a really interesting question is, what does a portfolio look like for a political scientist, for a social worker, for a mathematician, right? It might look very different, but what is the thing that A, is helpful to a student and the teacher in tracking their progress, but B, might even in the, be, be relevant to um, future um, schools or, or employers? Any more questions? Oof. Alphabetical order. 
Uh, thanks. Very interesting. And I see this as a practical uh, thing because you took, you've taken us into some um, different dimensions. Um, my question is, since you mentioned that this is a research project also, Dave, is that AI also? Because I've been thinking from before that we're talking about education and, you know, the students and whatever. We never talked about teachers because when you disrupt the industry, teachers are just like taxi drivers, uh, are a part where they might either join the, you know, on a different angle. So is this a re an AI research for correcting or for, if you wish, uh, giving grades to, to students? Is that mentioned in the curriculum? So, so we're, we're a computer science lab. It's an interesting place to be because I have an education background, but my PhD students, they're, they have to get a computer science PhD. They have to uh, go for, for a committee that might not have anyone who's interested in education. Um, so a lot of the research projects are, in fact, um, around uh, artificial, not necessarily for grading, but for optimizing. Um, you know, we have this idea of intelligent tutor, so it's a system that knows exactly what you need and gives you the right thing. Um, how does that work with social, with social learning? So we know that social learning is very powerful for certain skills, certain things. If you, when do you switch between individual and collaborative? How do you optimize who is in the group? What the gr how do you optimize the group trajectory and not just the individual trajectory? Uh, maybe with enough data, you could even take an entire scenario and say, actually, you know, in certain circumstances, you should switch the order of these activities. Um, so there's a lot of uh, things that we're looking at. I think of it more as uh, giving teachers superpowers, right? Um, one of the examples I didn't show was this, uh, this very, very nice tool um, that they developed in the US for grading exams. So let's say you have a first year computer science class and you don't wanna give them multiple choice because you want them to really think about the answers. So you have a written exam, 600 people take it. Now you have 600 paper exams you have to to grade, and again, you have this problem of, you know, you give lots of feedback, they throw it in the trash once they look at their final grade. So what this, what this approach does is they put them through a scanner, which apparently is, is very fast if you have a nice scanner, and then the system, using AI, segments all the answers so that you can grade all the answers to question one in the sequence instead of grading one in one exam. So that's already actually nice. But then you can give some feedback to one student, and then you have a list, and then, oh, he made the same error, I'm just gonna give the same feedback, right? So now, you're being more efficient, you're giving more detailed feedback, but you're also getting this really rich learning analytics, which is what I was talking about earlier, is that now you know very detailed about every answer, what the students got, and what kind of mistakes they did, and whether one question was, was related to another question or not, and how you, and then you can track that across sessions, right? So in this sense, we're using lots of machine vision and artificial intelligence and matching and stuff like that, but we're not taking the teacher out of the loop. We're, we're kind of magnifying the power of the teacher to uh, give personalized attention to many more students. There's a second question that popped up just while you're talking about this. Um, this, is, this is a worrying thing when you talk about AI either substituting or maybe in some, inst some institutions are gonna take AI to replace you know, paying and whatever. And probably this is one thing that comes to mind about uh, Elon Musk when he's talking about you know, the, the scary parts of AI. And that's my question to you. When, when, when this is an outsource or uh, open source thing and they're building an AI, which, uh, what kind of you know, controls, because if it becomes an AI, who's gonna control whether the AI is continuing to do something uh, Good. You know, maybe you, you can't answer the answer uh, that thing directly, but that's something that worries me. You know, if my someone that I know is gonna, you know, use this tool, and the tool not grades him, but kind of like gives him the graphs that are necessary for him to move to another uh, environment. So that's my question about if this is AI, which institution is controlling whether, you know, AI is needs another AI for that matter. I, I think there's lots of questions around this and we won't address most of them, but I will mention one other thing uh, that maybe, maybe is relevant, which is explainability of algorithms. This is becoming something very important now because a lot of AI algorithms, machine learning algorithms, they're kind of black boxes. You give them tons of data and you tell them what the output should be and they learn a model, and, but you don't know that model is opaque. 
you cannot look into it. You just give it new data and it will predict some new outcome, but you don't know why it predicted that. And that works great for, for certain purposes, but as, if your student gets a B and you say, why? And you say, I don't know, the, the, the model predicted a B. This is not good enough. So there is now a lot of research looking into explainable algorithms and, and accountability and who decides if it's a cor corporation that sold a system to the university that predicted uh, some student behavior, and the university might not even have access to that. So I think there's a lot of interesting ethical questions that we need to grapple with. One is called the East Coast School and one is called the West Coast School. The East Coast is New York City, Boston, Harvard, and, and these guys try to build rule-based AI. And that's, they had long, long tradition, 20, 30 years thinking about rule-based AI. And that's something that you can actually uh, reason about. When you say it's B, you can go and check the follow, follow. it's still AI, still machine learning, but it's rules-based. The West Coast, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, they have the black box AI that says, well, you know what, this has been, you're, you've been working on this for 30 years and you're still not good enough. Like, it's good, but it's not good enough. If we, if we, if we just you know, forget about explaining the reason for, the, for any result, then we can use all these statistical techniques and we get better results. And now it starts to be, to, to be good enough from, from an outcome point of view. But that's a black box and that's the problem. So I think, I'm, I'm not sure Stian is in a better position to talk about this, but I think there is much more research on education in the East Coast using AI in education. Probably that's part of, of, of the issue, like the different schools of thought within the United States about AI, whether it's rule-based or whether it's black box. So that, like, we might see more rule-based just because people wouldn't be happy with an answer that says, you got a B, and I cannot tell you why. We'll see. Okay? Okay, thank you very much.